this microphone has the right level on it now. In these drawings, my back is toward you through most of the message, so the mic has to work pretty good. And let me say what I'm, uh, how much I'm enjoying being here, and I'm, I'm getting the blessing. I've been with every service except the business meeting. I'm going to be with every service through Wednesday night and get my cup filled up and get a charge out of things, which I need. And, you know, I heard the first speaker speak, and I, I thought maybe I ought to send all my students up to Maranatha instead of Pensacola. <laughs> I heard the second speaker speak, and I figured I ought to take the sword of the Lord. And I heard the third speaker speak, and figured I ought to build up a big Sunday school. I heard the fourth speaker. I'm all confused tonight. <laughs> so I thought I'd just preach some Bible tonight. And if you have a Bible tonight... <laughs> no offense, no offense. <laughs> Uh, I want to have you take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah, and we're going to study a while on Jeremiah tonight, and keep Jeremiah kind of near, and uh, I'm going to talk tonight about uh, ministerial wipeouts, <laughs> or, <laughs> or how to be a flop in the ministry, and my subject matter is found in the book of Jeremiah. All right, take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. We call this man the weeping prophet. And we call this man the weeping prophet because in Jeremiah 9, chapter 1, he prays to the Lord and he says, I want to have my head be waters, my eyes be fountains to run down with tears day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And it occurs several times in there. For example, in, uh, in uh, chapter 14, verse 17, you might turn to that. Chapter 14, verse 17. And in chapter 14, verse 17, he says it again. He says he wants his eyes to trickle down and run down with tears day and night for the slain of the virgin daughter of his people. We call him the weeping prophet. This is the only man in the Bible who is commanded not to marry and not to have children. Uh, the reason why, of course, is Jeremiah is a type of tribulation saint. Uh, when Jesus Christ going to the cross, he says to the daughters of Jerusalem, he said, uh, Weep not for me, weep for yourselves. For the days are coming when they shall say, Blessed are the wombs that are barren, blessed are the paths that never gave suck. Now, the only thing you have there in birth control right there has to do with tribulation. He said, If they do these things in a green tree, what do they do in the dry? He says, Woe be to them that have children in those days, Matthew chapter 24. So in the tribulation, uh, people who have children are going to have a hard time, going to have twice the trouble they have now. Now, Jeremiah is plainly a type of tribulation to saint. He might be the man-child over there in Revelation 12. We don't have time going to that. Anyway, the Lord told him, he said over there in Jeremiah, he said, Don't get married, don't have children in this place. And so we call this man the weeping prophet. And I guess if ever a man was a washout in the ministry, this man was. There have been some notable washouts. I mean, did you ever think about the Apostle Paul? He died in jail. No children, no Sunday school, no buses, no nothing. <laughs> very, very ignominious end, brother, for the greatest Christian that ever lived. I mean, I appreciate Simon Peter getting 3,000 people saved, but Paul could tell Peter where to hit him any day. And he died in the jail. Have to watch that. Have to watch that. Now, I'm going to say five things tonight about uh, the weeping prophet. I'm going to say five things about the failures in the ministry. The first thing I've all to notice about this man is this man was called without his consent. Called without his consent. Now you start thinking about that. Most of you fellows were dealt with by the Lord. I know I was. And the Lord said, I want you to preach. And we wrestled and hassled out with the Lord and finally said yes or said no or fought the thing out or some kind of an experience there. And yet this man here, turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. And notice in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 6, that this man here was called without even being asked about it. How'd you like to be called in the ministry without your consent? In verse 1 to 6, the Lord says to Jeremiah, I've called thee and ordained thee a prophet from the womb, and before you ever saw the light of day, when your mother is belly, I'll ordain you and sanctify you and set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. Then Jeremiah says, Ah, oh, Lord God, I am but a child and cannot speak. Well, you stop thinking about that thing, Lord call him in the ministry without saying boo to him about it. The uh, Lord appeared to Moses and said, I want you to do this and that. Moses argued with him a while. He called Gideon and said, I want you to do this and that. Gideon argued with him a while. Jesus Christ went by the receipt of custom and he said to Matthew, he said, follow me. And Matthew gave up all that he had and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't have to. Why, well, you never read about the Lord going back and getting that fellow who went to bury his father. He said, that fellow, he said, follow me. And the fellow said, I got to go bury my father. And Christ said, let the dead bury the dead. You never found out whether the man came or not. But Jesus didn't go back and get a double arm lock on him and a full Nelson and make him come. But he did Jeremiah. He did Jeremiah. He said, I've called you to be a prophet, and you're going to be a prophet. And Jeremiah said, I don't want to be a prophet. The Lord said, tough apples, that's what you're going to be. <laughs> you get that in the next version. <laughs> I keep messing with him. Uh, you know, 
You know, there's an old say in the army, but it goes like this. You know, it says, never hurry, never worry, never volunteer. See? Stay away from the other room, keep your mouth shut if it's moving, salute it. If it's lying down, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. <laughs> That's one of those old things. And, he, and they say, never hurry, never worry, never volunteer. Well, Jeremiah didn't volunteer. He didn't volunteer. But he was called without his consent. All right, that isn't all. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. In Jeremiah chapter 11, look at verse 18 to 21. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 18 to 21. In Jeremiah 11, 18, 21, I call your attention to the fact that this man was cursed without a cause. Cursed without a cause. He says there in Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 18 to 21, he said, I was like a lamb, or like an ox, drawn to the slaughter. And he said, they devised devices against me, which I knew not. And uh, they said, let's destroy the tree and cut off his fruit and take him out off from the land of the living. Uh, this man was hated without a cause, like Jesus Christ. The Bible said this, uh, Jesus Christ said this comes to pass, and they all, they hated me without a cause. And they hated Jeremiah without a cause. Uh, no reason for it, just hated him, cussed him. He said, everyone that looks at me curses me. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 18, look at verse 18 to 20. Jeremiah 18, 18 to 20. Jeremiah 18, 18 to 20. And that passage, notice again, they got it in for him again. This fellow just had a, he just had a talent for getting folks upset at him and mad at him. And verse 18 and 20, he says about these people here, he says, uh, uh, shall good be recompensed for evil? But he said, they've digged a pit for me, and, and they said, come, let's smite Jeremiah with a tongue. And he said, they're going to lie about him, talk about him, and cuss him out. Let's smite him with a tongue, they say. And let's don't give heed to any of his words. And they sit down there, he said, uh, he says to the Lord, he said, these people have digged a pit for me. And he said, uh, shall good be recompense for evil, or evil recompense for good for this thing? And he says on down there in verse, about verse 20, he says, Lord, remember, remember that I stood in the way to speak for you to turn your wrath from them. When God calls a man to preach, he calls him to stand and to stand between the Lord and the people. That's what Moses did. He's an intercessor. He's a priest. I know he doesn't offer up physical sacrifices. I'm no papist. I can read my Bible. He says in Hebrews chapter 13, it's spiritual sacrifices. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, it's spiritual sacrifices. But, you know, when you stand in the pulpit, you fellas here call the preach and stand there and put it out, you're doing, you're doing a job that God would rather have done that way than take a hand to it himself. I mean, it's much better to get rebuked than chastened. See? And it's much better to sit in front of a preacher just taking off your hide, hair and all, and salt it down and nail the wall, that's a lot better than just staying away from it and having the Lord take a hand to it. Amen? You better amen. You better amen. Or the Lord now will take a hand to it. And you take old Jeremiah, Jeremiah spoke up for the Lord, and he said, I stood in the way to turn your wrath from them. If they listened to Jeremiah, the wrath of God wouldn't have fallen on Jerusalem. But they wouldn't listen to him. So he was cursed without a cause. Furthermore, turn to chapter 20 and look at verse 10 to 18. Chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 10 to 18. And notice further about old Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 10 to 18, that he is faithful without friends. And that isn't easy. That isn't easy. You know, the worst kind of trouble is faithless friend trouble, family trouble, trouble with loved ones. And that fellow was faithful without friends. I read in the Bible where uh, when Paul got down near the end, he said, I've just got one friend left. He said, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Last friend he had, the only person that stuck to him all the way was Luke. The only person that went all the way with the Lord Jesus Christ was John the Apostle. The only person that went all the way with Jeremiah was Baruch. And when he got down near the end, he just had one friend left. And the old boy was faithful without friends and just kept putting it out and putting it out, putting it out, putting it out. Look at verse 10 to 18 in chapter 20. He said, all my familiars watch for my halting. Those he was familiar with, his friends. And they said, uh, they said, peradventure he'll halt, we'll get him. Report, the familiar say, and we'll report it. They say, give us a report, no Jeremiah. What's going on with Jeremiah? Did you ever get those kind of things going on? I got a telephone call one time up north, and somebody said, how you doing, Brother Pete? I said, just fine. They said, you feel any better? I said, any better than what? And they said, well, we heard you had an operation, and you're recovering. I said, I'm any operation. They said, we heard you'd been in the hospital, had a heart attack. I said, no, I just wishful thinking to somebody's fire. <laughs> Get used to that for a while, you know. And they say, report, we'll report it. And all my familiars, he said, turned against me, faithful without friends. Uh, you know, when you, have, when you have home trouble and loved one trouble, you have the worst kind of trouble there is because you can't get away from it. If you have trouble downtown, you can always come home. 
That's right. But you know, you get in that plane, take off in that plane, and sail off someplace, and you bury the boy back there in the cemetery, that old casket travels right with you, doesn't it? And listen, you go to the Swiss Alps, you can get out that plane at Frankfurt and take a train down to the Swiss Alps, get up there in the Cairo, and see those colors like no artist's palette in this world can reproduce them. You see those snow-covered mountains and smell that fresh Bavarian air, or you see these flowers on the graves. Those are real troubles. Those are real troubles. Those aren't make-believe troubles. A lot of God's people have a lot of make-believe troubles. All kinds of troubles in my head that don't amount to a thing in this world. I said to a lady one time, she'd been in and out of insane asylum down in Chattahoochee four or five times, and she said, well, I just, I just had mental problems. I had mental problems all the time. I said, look at here, you've got a beautiful house. She said, yes. I said, you've got a husband that loves you. I mean, fella, some of them men that got the wife down there, they might just lock her up and throw away the key and forget her. And he paid her bill four times, got her in, got her out. And that woman was worried about, oh, I got mental troubles, I got mental troubles. I said, how do you know you got mental troubles? She said, the psychiatrist told me I had mental troubles. <laughs> well, sure, that guy makes his living. <laughs> and she said, but I've always known I've had troubles. I said, well, how do you know you've always had troubles? She said, I just don't feel like myself. I said, well, how do you feel when you feel like yourself? And she didn't even know. Poor, poor soul. You know, I told that lady, I said, go to the hospital, go to the spastic clinic, go to the cancer ward, find some folks that got some troubles. Quit banging your head against the wall. You haven't gotten very many troubles. And some of you people got troubles tonight, but a lot of you don't. And a lot of you ministers sitting there tonight, you may have church problems and things, but you don't have any real problems, some of you. Some of you do, some of you don't. You got a good suit of clothes on. You got food under your belt. You're in good health. You're saved. That's pretty good, ain't it? I mean, isn't it? <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, if you're saved in good health, you've got 98% of the world's population whipped to start with. So it isn't so bad. You know, I'm all for tears in the pulpit, and I'm all for compassionate preaching, but sometimes some of these fellows that get in sobbing and, and get all emotional and torn up over some hound dog or died or something, you know, kind of makes me kind of sick. I mean, there are some people in this world that had real troubles, brother, real troubles. I'm not against the preacher crying in the pulpit. I wish I could show more compassion than I do and cry more tears than I've wept over unsaved people. And I mean it. But I'll tell you, some of this stuff is sickening, this, this schmaltz in Christian circles today. I was up one time in a fellowship meeting up in Ohio, and I, I don't know the guy's name, and a good thing I don't. I, I'd be tempted to say it, but I'm not going to say it because I don't know it. <laughs> and uh, that fellow up there, he got up to preach, and, and I noticed he kind of funny when he got up, you know, and everybody began to kind of get in the mood of the thing. And somebody turned to me, and he said, this fellow here has really got compassion, you know. And I said, well, good, boy, I'll... Get a good lacing out, and I need it too, you know. So I got there listening to him, and he got up there, and he began to sniff and sob, you know. And he said, Oh, friends, we turn to this wonderful verse. John 3.16, we just... I thought to myself, man, is it real? You know, is it real? And I was watching the children, and they saying, Bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. And then he got in there. I thought to myself, well, he isn't sick, and nobody died in the family, you know. And there wasn't any unsaved people in the building. All well, a bunch of preachers, a fellowship, you know, about 20 of us. And he said, uh, and oh, he said, I just want to say, oh, good God. I thought, oh, that's really good, you know. Some guy said, bless him, Lord, bless him, Lord. And then the guy said, then he said, uh, how good God. And you know what he was so stirred up about? The fact that somebody had given his quartet a bouquet at an all-night thing. That's what it was. And I guess, and then he gave us this beautiful bouquet of they're back there saying, bless him, Lord, bless him, Lord. I was back there saying, kick him, Lord, kick him, Lord. <laughs> All that stuff. Or right, if this man was faithful without friends, and I'll call your attention to something else, take your Bible and turn to chapter 38. Chapter 38, begin at verse 4. In chapter 38, beginning at verse 4, I learned something else about this man. This man, like the Lord Jesus Christ, was jailed without a jury jail without a jury. The trial of the Lord Jesus Christ was one of the most unfair, illegal things that ever took place upon the face of this earth. At night, with no witnesses, no counsel for the defense, no legitimate judge, no legitimate witnesses, bribe witnesses, and that's the case of old Jeremiah. Old Jeremiah was jailed without a jury. Look at chapter 38 and verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. They got going against Jeremiah, and they said, this man seeketh the wealth, not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. He's preaching against the government. He'll weaken the hands of the men in the city. You've got to get rid of him. You've got to do something with him. And they took old Jeremiah and they let him down the dungeon with old clouts and rotten cords. 
and they let him down there, and old Jeremiah, the Bible says, sank down in the mire. Failure, failure, failure in the ministry. You know something, gentlemen? Failure after great effort is better in God's sight than success with a little bit of effort. That old book speaks about faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. Be thou faithful unto death. That's what's required, faithfulness. Listen, if you had to cut the corner to get it, you weren't faithful. It may be a whale of a thing. The Lord is interested in the motive. All right, the fellow was down there. And he was down there, and don't you know he got bitter? Look at chapter 20. Turn to chapter 20 and look at verse 7 and 9. You talk about a bitter man. Old Jeremiah and Job, I guess, were two of the most bitter men in the Bible. And I guess I was just born in the sour side of life or something with vinegar. I've always liked vinegar and lemons and Tabasco sauce and onions and garlic and dill pickle juice, you know. I can drink vinegar, you know, just put ice cubes in it and just drink it, just like ice tea. And I've always kind of leaned that way. And to me, I've always loved Job and Jeremiah. <laughs> now, I don't know how you are in your private devotions, see, and I'm not going to cry in your private life. But when me and the Lord get together, I try to talk plain. And Job talked plain. Job said one time to the Lord, he said, how about getting away from me and let me swallow down my own spit? <laughs> That's pretty plain talk, isn't it? You know, so that is New Testament. Yeah, I know it's not New Testament. But you know something? Old Job didn't have the benefits that Paul had. Paul had the cross behind him. It wasn't around Job's day. Paul had, a, Paul had 39 books to read. Job had nothing to read. See? And he got pretty bitter. And old Jeremiah got better. Look at chapter 20 there, verse 7 to 9. He said, Oh, Lord, he said, you're stronger than me. You've deceived me. Like him to the devil. See? He said, you deceived me. You deceived me. And he said, uh, the word of the Lord has made to me a reproach. And he said, because of that thing, he said, I'll mention, I won't mention his name anymore. I won't speak anymore in his name. I'm not going to mention it. Oh, boy, I got bitter. You know what he did? He quit the ministry. Look at chapter 15, verse 18. Chapter 15, verse 18. You talk about talking to the Lord in plain terms. 15, 18. There wasn't any pious hogwash in that thing, brother. Look at 15, 18. Will thou be all together to me as a liar or waters that fail? Is that what it says there? Uh, as a, as a, a, wa wa a liar or waters that fail? Come on, got a liar? My, 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 my. That fellow was down there in the dungeon. He got down there and that old water was dripping and seeping him down there. And you know something, when he first fell down that hole, I bet he just cried and cried like his heart would come out of his mouth and groaned around there and banged his head in that wall like a wounded animal. And boy, after about an hour, he began to kind of calm down. After about two hours, he kind of began to get kind of icy, and pretty soon he just pulled up in the bottom of that old well with a drip in that water and lay there and just glared at a stone down in front of him. His, old, his face just got as petrified as a rock. About that time, the Lord came down. And he said, how you doing, Jeremiah? Fine. How you doing? <laughs> Lord said, uh, you enjoyed it down here? Having a good time? Romans 8, 28. Learned every state I'm in there with to be content. Jeremiah said, never had better in my life. Lord said, you're kind of bitter, aren't you, Jeremiah? He said, well, I got a right to be. Lord said, let me hear you say praise the Lord. Jeremiah says, praise the Lord, you know, you know. And Lord said, you're bitter. And Jeremiah said, I got a right to be bitter. I mean, look at here. You said, call to me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, but thou knowest not. And I've been calling upon you, and I haven't got no answer. And those folks out still out there in my church are fussing and fighting about where the piano ought to be, and who forgot to send flowers to Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> and somebody's arguing about a new organ, and nobody's getting saved, and the kids are kicking books off the chair off of the service, and everybody's winding the watch and looking around the ceiling during the invitation. And what do you mean? What do you mean? Great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. I'm an association missionary, still working on my deacons, having coffee and cake with them, you know, behind my back, and it's starting to piss me off. So what do you mean? What do you mean, a uh, great and mighty thing, which thou knowest not? We've been running 150 in Sunday school for 10 years. <laughs> I believe in being practical, gentlemen. <laughs> I believe in being practical. And you know, he got down there and he got talking like that, and the Lord said, what's the matter? You want to quit the ministry? And Jeremiah said, uh, you give me a bona fide proposition? <laughs> and the Lord said, yeah, I am. I am. And Jeremiah said, you on the level? You, you level with me? Yeah, square deal. You want to quit? Jeremiah said, well, then aren't you mentioning I said, I do want to quit. And the Lord said, okay, quit. 
Jeremiah said, you mean it? Lord said, I mean it. Jeremiah said, there must be a catch to it. And the Lord said, all right, there's just one catch. If you quit, you can't speak in my name anymore. Okay? Okay? It's a deal. Shake, shake. <laughs> and he resigned. He just got out. And about the time he shook the Lord's hand and got out, the big rope came down there. And uh, Ebed Mellick, some of those fellows, hauled him out and pulled him up out of that thing and landed him on dry ground. He got up on top of the ground and said, thank you, Lord. And the Lord said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. You're not supposed to say that name. Oh, I forgot. You know, if you're saved, you can't ever really forget. And you'll open your big mouth, put your foot in it somewhere. And some of you fellows that don't witness and don't go to visitation and don't pass out tracts and don't win souls, some of you fellows 40 and 50 years old, down where you work, you think you've passed off as one of the crowd, and they start telling dirty jokes and giving it a hard time, and the spirit and you get grieved and grieved, well, you can't stand it, and all of a sudden you say, shut up! And everybody in that plant turns around and looks at you like a tree full of owls, and says, what's wrong with him? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with you, you're saved. <laughs> That's what's wrong with you. And you can't keep your mouth shut, it'll come out somewhere. Just as soon as he got up, he said, thank you, Father. Never mind, can't speak. Oh, I forgot. Okay, okay, no more, okay, no more. But it'll come out. Did you ever try to be real careful about, you know, keeping something under your uh, lips and have a slip on you? Mayor Roberts Reinhardt said the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to her was one time at her house, she invited a man over for dinner to have a strawberry nose. And a strawberry nose is kind of an ugly-looking thing, and a drunkard is nearly always happened. But some people are just afflicted with them that don't drink. I mean, it isn't always due to liquor. Sometimes it's just... Uh, trouble with the blood vessels and arteries and things and veins. Just unfortunate, can't be helped. And that was the case here. This man was not a drunkard. He just had the, the affliction. And she told her children before he came over, she said, now, boys and girls, when this man comes over, for goodness sake, don't say anything about his nose. And they, she said, don't point at it and don't look at it. Because it's very embarrassing. And they said, yes, Mom. And over he came. And a couple hours went by there, and they did just fine. And she did, of course, it was kind of tense, you know, kind of strained, you know, trying to go out of the way to be polite and nice and everything. And the kids never looked, never said a word. And after supper, she bought him the coffee, and she put on the coffee, and she bent over him and said, would you have cream or sugar in your nose? <laughs> <laughs> blew the whole thing, just blew it all to pieces. <laughs> And you take Jeremiah, Jeremiah climbed out there and got that place and brushed himself off, and he said, okay. He said, okay, I'm not going to speak any more in his name. And he walked down the street, and he said, good, good, good. Don't have to put up with a, a, this board and that board and the trustees and all this stuff anymore. Don't have to worry about getting kicked to put on the post. I can settle down the country and raise chickens and have a steady income with my family. I got it made. I'm glad I got out of ministry. That's good enough. And boy, about that time he started down in Jerusalem, here came one of those demonstrations. About 20 deep and a mile, those hippies coming down there, you know, mini skirts and no skirts and bare tops and hair down to the back end of the shoulders, you know, with all their weed and pot and dirty slogans, a big old sign out there saying, make the world safe for homosexuals, you know, and help the mentally sick or I'll kill you, you know, and st stomp out violence, you know, and this space for rent and all that kind of business. And to hell with a Baptist all coming down there. And old Jeremiah took one look at that thing, boy, and that old vein in his forehead began to stand out and that's ears began to turn beet red, and that old boy began to pant and wheeze, that group got closer. Well, they'll get you going, man. They'll get you going. You still ought to love them. Yeah, yeah, I know you ought to love them. You love the hair, too? It's part of them, ain't it? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that's the most revolting thing. And uh, You know, if a guy whistled at me, I'd go come cut my hair, you know that? <laughs> I've got, uh, you take over in our Bible school over there, we got some tough ones. I mean, I've heard these people talk about youth movements to young people, this and that, and I never decided, I never had that problem. I guess I never grew up or something, you know, but with me, it's right on, man. I mean, we, we go, and we got kids over there that'll, they'll bump into them and say, pardon me, ma'am, <laughs> and I wouldn't do that, see, and I don't encourage them to do that. We got some over there that have been known to go into certain churches and turn statues upside down, you know, but I don't encourage them to do that, see, and I don't approve of it, you understand, but, and we have some kind of radical ones, you know. And uh, from time to time, I don't encourage them. I really don't, really don't. But, uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I, I really don't. <laughs> and uh, at one time, one of these fellows got out of his car, you know, he had that hair flowing down the back end of nowhere, you know, and one of our boys whistled at him, you know. And that kid goes under his Volkswagen and pulls out a 38, you know, and waves at our kid. And our kid works for a telephone company. And we just then took out a big old wrench about that long and took <laughs> it right back in like that. We had a couple of Christians over there and ran a gas station. And a couple of those long-haired characters came over there, whatever they are. I don't know what they are. Like that marriage out in California, be whatever you are, take whatever it is to be whatever you're trying to be. 
from them things, you know. And, 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 the, and these two things, wherever they were, got out. And they said to one of our, of the gas station, and he was a Christian, they said, uh, they said, have you got a restroom here? And they said, well, they got two. <laughs> you know. I said, well, you got male and female. You know, I don't want whatever she got. And you see those things, they say, well, brother, you ought to love them. Yeah, I guess you ought to love them. You love the hair, too. That's part of them. So I love them. Yeah, yeah, I love them, I love them, I love them, but stay away from them. You try that thing a little too far sometimes. Anyway, he got going there, and here was this crowd coming down there, all these hippies and hippies coming down there waving these signs. And old Jeremiah, before he knew what he was doing, he's up in a fire plug, waving those hands in there, and saying, You bunch of dirty low down rock good for nothing, you going to hell. And they started throwing the tomatoes at him and the tin cans, the bananas and the coffee ground, the onion fields, you know, and pretty soon he was covered from head to foot and climbed out off that thing, went back in an alley someplace. And I bet she went down there with those old tin cans and things and lay down there beside those old garbage cans and things and just cried his heart out and said, Lord, I told you I wouldn't do it. I told you I wouldn't do it, but I did it. Why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep doing it? And the Lord said, Jeremiah, it's my word. It's my word. And brother, if you believe that word and that word is in you, man, it's a burning fire. It'll burn you up. It'll burn you up. He said, it's my word. It's like a burning fire. I was weary with forbearing and could not contain, could not stay. Then I spake, I spake, and brother, he spake. Did you ever get like Jeremiah? You know, maybe, maybe you've never been through those kind of things. Maybe I'm, folks think I'm kind of melodramatic about it, you know, and giving over a statement about it. And I don't know, I wonder sometimes it's what some of the brethren been through. You know, experience is something you get and you're looking for something else. Did you ever get an experience? I remember I went through a very dark time in my life, very deep valley, oh, several years back, and it got so bad. It got so bad, I couldn't read my Bible. And you know something? When you can't read your Bible, things are rough. And when I can't read a Bible, things are really rough. I mean, I believe that book. I believe it like a lot of folks don't believe it. I teach my young men over there, there are no proven mistakes in it. So, so I bet I can find one. Okay, I'm room 219, or I'm out of in. I'll be here all week. Help yourself. You know, I'm not as smart a lot of folks. A lot of folks think they're smart enough to correct that book. I'm not that smart. I've only had 22 years of formal education. I'm not as bright as some of you people are. But I'm working on it. I'm working on it. One of our young men went down to Pensacola one time and stopped a fellow down there who was teaching. And he talked to our young man a while. He said, you're a Ruckmanite. <laughs> That's what they call them old Pensacola, Ruckmanites. He said, you're a Ruckmanite. The kid said, how do you know that? He said, you think that King James Bible is verbally inspired? Well, our kid didn't say that. He said, I don't teach that. I don't teach the King James Bible is verbally inspired. I teach original manuscripts are verbally inspired. I teach the King James Bible is preserved without proven error. See, I teach that. In other words, I believe there's, there's not a fault in it. Now, if you can find one, you've got more brains than I got. And I'd like to see it. I've looked at a few of them. I've looked at a few of them. So he said, well, you think it's verbally inspired? And the kid said, well, uh, he said, uh, I'm not following anybody. You're following a man. You're following a man, you know, following a ruckman. You know, you're a ruckmanite, that kind of business. Following a man. And this kid said, well, do you think the mistakes in that Bible? And the man said, yes. And the kid said, did God show them to you? <whistles> well, who showed them to you, fella? You're following a man, aren't you? I didn't show them to you. You couldn't be following me. I don't show any to you. <laughs> All right? When I when it gets why I can't read my Bible, things are tough. And I'll tell you, it was rough. You know, uh, the certain habits you develop in life that are just about, you just hardly can get over them. And one of the habits I developed early in life was reading. I read a book a day since I was 10 years old, easily. Maybe, maybe, maybe more than that, but certainly a book a day. And I get where I can't even eat without reading. I can't do nothing without reading. If I'm taking a bath, I'm reading. If I'm eating, I'm reading. If I'm calling the telephone, I'm going through something like this while I'm talking on the phone. And you get in a habit like that. And you know something? When I went through a certain situation, trouble and trial and testing I had, which wasn't much, alongside what a lot of you have been through, but it was pretty tough for me. When I went through that kind of a thing, I got the place where I couldn't read the Bible. And boy, I couldn't read the Bible. I was hard up, man. I had to read something. And so I began to look around for stuff to read. Well, I wouldn't read a newspaper. I don't even take a newspaper. I mean, you couldn't get any truth in that. You couldn't get enough religious and political truth out of a daily newspaper to put in the left eye of a blind mosquito. And I went down to, I went down to the news rack. 
and I got on the news rack and got looking around down there, and I said, and you know what a news rack is. I mean, that's just a, that's just a collapsible garbage fan, man. And I walked around there and looked at that stuff and said, no, I can't read that junk there. I saw a bunch of novels. I didn't like to read novels anymore. I used to when I was younger. But you know, once you've tasted the manna from heaven, boy, and got on the truth of that book and got down deep, stuff that's novel, doesn't, it doesn't interest you. And I'd skip through there and skip through there. I couldn't find nothing. And finally I saw a little old paper back there called Stalingrad. That guy's name was Theodore Pleaver. And I got looking at the cover of that thing. And the cover of that thing was an 88, you know, fire in the snow with a bunch of boys lying around getting shot at and freezing. Some of them dead and some of them dying. And I got looking at that thing and I said, now that'd be good there. And that, that fellow was there. That ain't no novel. That fellow was there. He saw what he's writing about, so I get that. So I got that. And I went home and got reading that. And I got reading that. And you know, I'll tell you a strange thing happened. I said what my problem was, when well, I picked up the Bible, you know, it'd say, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And I called him upon the day of trouble, and nothing happened. <laughs> and then, you know, it said, uh, Hear me, Lord, answer me speedily, you know. And I'd call, and he didn't answer speedily, he didn't answer at all. Did you ever get through one of those things? Um, did you ever just go one of those things, you just confessed all your sin, and judged all your sin, and forsook all your sins, and claimed all the promises, and drew a blank? That's what I'm talking about. I mean, maybe some of these fellows, they, these giants of faith, I'm not. I'm not. See, I'm one of these, I'm one of these flops. <laughs> and I got claiming these promises, and you know, it got where I couldn't read that book, because when I read through there, there'd just be promise after promise after promise. And I said to myself, well, God isn't lying. I know the book's true, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so I folded up. And then somebody said, well, why don't you go and study the doctor? And I had enough doctor. And I got enough doctrine to drive me nuts. Matter of fact, the doctor I can stand. And besides, my problem wasn't doctrinal. <laughs> I needed a promise. And I'd go along there and couldn't find a thing, you know, and so I'd go down the newsstand and got this thing. I got reading that thing, and boy, you know something? The Lord began to speak to that little old paperback book. And the Lord said, look at here. You weren't cut out to stand in front of people in nice clothes, with nice shoes. You weren't cut out to go to the hospital and hold people's hands and read the Bible to them. Why, you weren't trained for this. Not me. I mean, my daddy was a... Captain of World War I, the Colonel of World War II, my grandfather was a general, great-grandfather a general, brother a sergeant, I was a lieutenant. We weren't trained for this kind of business. The Lord said, you know what you were raised for? You know what you were trained for? I said, yes, Lord. You were trained to lie up in that mud, man, get shot at. Lie up in that snow and freeze. Get in that sand, man, get your head blown off. That's what you were raised for. I said, yeah, that's the truth. And you know, I went back to my old bed that night, got in that bed and stuck my feet down to those clean sheets, and boy, did they feel good. And I got up the next night and got a little bowl of pea green soup there, that smoky pea green soup, green pea soup. <laughs> and I got that stuff, you know, the piece of black bread got eaten that man, it tasted like porterhouse steak. I began to come out of it. I began to appreciate it. You know, I haven't looked backward for a while. I've been looking forward so long, I can keep telling you to do, <laughs> that I forgot to look back from the pit from whence I was digged. <laughs> And when I got looking at that thing, it got better and better. And first thing you know, I had that Bible back in my hand again, going through it, man, going through it. And I go through there and say, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I'll glorify me, and I'll, uh, thou shalt uh, glorify, deliver me, and thou shalt glorify me. And I read that thing, and the devil say, It doesn't work. And I say, Well, I guess the wrong dispensation. <laughs> and I turn it. <laughs> Get back in the book again. Get back in the book. You know, old Jeremiah, old Jeremiah was faithful, without friends. He was jailed without a jury. And listen, that old boy never ceased to preach the truth right on through. He got and got that fire plug and began to scream and yell and holler and roar. I bet you could hurt him for a quarter mile around. You know, when a man really believes something, he sounds off. I know they think a lot of us fundamentals are mean and nasty and roaring and rough and crude and all this and that. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a lot of it depends on your temperament. I say this, I've observed when most men, now I'm not talking about preachers, just as a bunch of people, but I mean men, just men. When men get in earnest about something, they speak out pretty clear. I mean, just men, you know. I was a man 27 years before I was a preacher. And when, they, when, when a man has his heart in something and is concerned about something, you'll hear about it. I hear some of these Campbellites preach on the radio and they say, and so we see in Acts 16 and 16, and Acts 2 and 38, that we should believe and be baptized and repent and be but He don't mean a word he's saying. He don't mean a word he's saying. Then the Campbellite in this town believes you have to be baptized in water to be saved. Not really. You say, I've talked to them. I've talked to them too, but not really. If the fellow meant it, he'd put something into it. You know something? If I thought you had to get baptized and be saved, you'd never hear such a storm. I start saying, brother, get in that pool. Get in that pool, brother. Get in that pool. 
I would say, and so we see in Acts 2 and 38, we should repent and believe and be baptized. <laughs> well, he don't mean what he's saying. Those guys are nuts. They're nuts. You say, I ain't go talking about a rough one. Yeah, nuts. Right, brother, nuts. You say, y'all love them. I love nuts. I love nuts. <laughs> I love nuts. But they're nuts. <laughs> you got to be half, about half crazy to deal with them. You know, I, I found a long time ago in dealing with those candlelight preachers that, uh, that it didn't do any good to try to reason with them. You know, they just went in a circle, and their mind would just run uh, Matthew 28, 18, 19, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Romans 6, 3, just go around in a circle. Well, right in the middle of the thing, you'd say that you said to God, boo, and he wouldn't even hear you. I mean, boy, out, brother. Why, well, if you spit on someone, they looked up to see if it was raining. <laughs> I was preaching one time out, and I'll get back to this in a minute. <laughs> I was preaching... <laughs> I was preaching one time out in a, in a fair in West Texas, a big old state fair, and we had a booth out there, and I'd drawn a picture, and we had a whole bunch of uh, Mexicans, Indians around there, hundreds and hundreds of them, and a real chance to get some of them to save, and I drew a picture of the crucifixion, and things were going real good, and about that time, a couple of those water dogs showed up. And they stayed alongside that booth there and stood right there and watched me, and when I got through, I started to give the invitation, and you know something? Before I could open my mouth, before I get my mouth open, one of those candlelights said, uh, Yes, brother, but what about Acts 2.38? Well, who can't ask, who can't handle that, you know? And I, I started to say something, and he said, and as far as that goes, First Peter 3, 21. And I started to say something, and he said, and what about Mark 16, 16? And I said, uh, and I just got uh open, and he said, as far as that goes, what about Romans 6, 3? And I said, well, and he said, and what about Galatians 3, 26? And I said, uh, and he said, what about Acts 22, 17? And then they just stood there like this. And all those Mexican Indians, you know, they looked at me. <laughs> I mean, you're turned to deal, man, see? It looks for them or me. And I don't know what to do. But you know, every now and then, when you just send up with those me and my prayers, the Lord gives you something. And I sent one up, and I said, well, that's right, I said. But what about Nehemiah 3510? And what about 3 Kings 264? And what, <coughs> and what about 2 Chronicles 215? And what about Genesis 492? And what about 3 Peter 264? And all those Indians. <laughs> and you know, as far as they're concerned, I want it thumbs down. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> but you know, the Bible says, answer a fool according to his story, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Amen, brother. Amen. All right, now, last of all, I want to have you turn to Jeremiah chapter 44. And in Jeremiah chapter 44, I want to have you notice this man was right without any reward. Right without any reward. Jeremiah 44. And you come down Jeremiah 44 and come down there, verse 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, on down there. And in that passage, Jeremiah 44, beginning about verse 15, coming through there, he says, he talked to those people about worshiping the Queen of Heaven, and they wouldn't listen to him. And all the men that knew their wives baked cakes and worshiped the Queen of Heaven, they wouldn't listen to him. And they would not hearken to him. And they took old Jeremiah captive. And you look at the last uh, verses in that thing right there, in the next chapter, and you find they took old Jeremiah and carried him away captive in Egypt. Now you stop thinking about that. What a way to treat a retired minister. <laughs> I mean, when the man got all through, he had no pension and no Lottie Moon offering, and he got all through, you know, with that thing, and when he got all through with that thing, instead of putting him a nice home on the outskirts of town, you know, where he could have coffee and cake with the society folks, they took that fellow up and bound him and took him down captive to Egypt, and he had to go through the whole thing again. You know that man's a sight? That man's a sight. That's one of the greatest failures in the ministry you ever saw. But there have been several of them. You take old Paul was down there in the dungeon near the end of his life. And about that time, the jailer came down there and the headsman with the axe to get him and take off his head. He said a couple of people laid down their necks for his sake, and he finally laid down his neck for the brethren and went home to be with the Lord. And that headsman came down there, axe and came down, opened the door, and said, how you doing? He said, okay. He said, what you run the Sunday school? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> what kind of building program you got going? Nothing. How much property you own? Books and parchments. And the coke I left at Troas. Who's in there with you? 
old Holland pop off and Eon Paisley and Richard Wormbrandt and some others. Now, gentlemen, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I'm all in favor of this kind of thing. I'm glad you got a beautiful plant here. I'd like to see 20,000 more like it. And I ain't kidding. I mean, I am not fooling. <laughs> and, you know, I go up there and preach to Brother Hanniger. He's got this great big old beautiful place out there. All these buses and preach for Brother Rollins. He's got a hundred buses out there. I don't know how many acres of stuff, ponds and lakes and flowers and all this stuff around there. And I think it's great. More the better. I'm all for it. I mean it. I'm sincere about it. Be preaching brother Vic up in Detroit here next summer. He got a great big old plant there out of this world, man. I'm all for it. I'm all in favor of it. But don't forget the grapes in Canaan, gentlemen. You don't get it all here. And you're not supposed to get it all here. And if you get it all here, you're not going to get it when you get over there. Somebody said, all that grapes in Canaan, you know, that's the believer's warfare. I know, I know, I know. I've heard all that stuff. I've heard all that stuff. Let me give you one. In Colossians chapter 3, he says, set your affections on things above and not on things on this earth. Brother, if your conversations of heaven, you're to set your affections on things up there, then just make sure your affections are set on things up there. And you're not going to get it all down here. If you if the more, if God wants to make a million out of you, brother, I'm all for it all the way. I think the Lord's people ought to have more money. The more money, the better. Fine, just fine. Don't forget the great just over Jordan. <laughs> just over Jordan. You don't get it all down here. Maybe some of you fellows will die poor. Listen, you know, if this government keeps going the way it's going, maybe we'll all die poor. <laughs> maybe we'll starve to death. I don't know. I like an old hillbilly preacher said over to our church, he said, if I were to starve to death, and he said, just to spite my enemies, you know, my Christian enemies, he said, if I were to starve to death, he said, they keep telling me if a preacher like I'm preaching, I'm going to starve to death. He said, I'd buy a box of bacon soda and a quart of vinegar and swallow it and drink it and swell up so bad when they found my corpse to think I died of gluttony. <laughs> Just for, you know, just for spite. Just for spite. <laughs> that kind of thing. You don't get it, you don't get it all here. You take, you take, uh, you take Jeremiah. Jeremiah got all through his preaching, went off down Egypt, and toward the end of his life, he passed away, you know, and Lord got him out there in paradise. He said, well, how are you doing, Jeremiah? He said, oh, I'm glad to get out of it, man. It's about time. And Lord said, pretty rough ministry, wasn't it? He said, yeah, I didn't get any converts. Lord, so that's you all you know about. Look over here. Pull back the veil there, and that old Jeremiah looks down there, and here's old Daniel over there in Daniel chapter 9. And old Daniel says, Then I understood by the books of the prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet how 70 years should be accomplished upon the destruction of Jerusalem. Daniel, pretty good convert. <laughs> Head of 120 providences, man, and converted a king. You could do worse. You could do worse. <laughs> yeah, that's right, brother. That's right. You take old Tyndall. Before they took old Tyndall out there and strangled him and hung him at the stake, they strangled him and then burned him for his translation. Before he died, you know, he prayed. He said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And that old boy, as far as I know, he spent his whole life translating and died and burned at the stake. And in less than a year after he was dead, the king made an official proclamation that that Bible was to be opened in every parish in England. See? But he didn't get the grapes till he got over Jordan. Oh, well, you've got to admit that it's pretty, pretty sad way to end a ministry, be hanging up this way, and have some guy come up behind you and put a piano wire around your neck and strangle you, and then burn your corpse and throw your ashes out to the river. That's not exactly the best way, you know, to go out into eternity. But you see, you've got to cross Jordan sometime to get the fruit of the land. Get all of it. Don't forget it. While you're getting all this, this is good. This is great, man. I'm enjoying it. But don't forget the great. There's an old boy named Stephen, and he was a, he was a Baptist preacher, the first water brother, and he got up there one night, and he had a talent for just getting folks all tore up, and he got up there before the Sanhedrin got preaching, and boy, he said, the Lord God of our fathers appeared in Mesopotamia near the Chaldees before Abraham, and all the Pharisees said, that's us, that's us, uh, Abraham, Isaac, <coughs> Jacob, <coughs> you know, and boy, said, he's going fine, and he comes down through there, and he says, and the patriarch, so forth and so forth, move with envy, so Joseph in Egypt. <coughs> Put a chill on the meeting. And he got going along there pretty soon. He said, and Moses came up, nourished, who was a proper child, and fair, went in before. That's us, da 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 you know, Moses, us, you know, us. And then he said, the fathers rejected Moses and said, we don't want this man to be ruling the judge. And some of Stephen's friends began to get out the back end of the church. One said, he's going to get it. He's going to do it again. He's going to do it. Every time he turns that guy loose, he does it. 
and he begins to pull out here and begins to pull out over here, you know. And Stephen gets down there in that thing and he says, uh, he says, he says, I'll be at the most high, dwell if not in temples made with hand, they say at the prophet, heaven is my throne and earth is my foot still. What house will you build me? See, my hand has made all these things. You stiff necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you doors if the Holy Ghost as your father said. So do ye, which one of the prophets have you been persecuted to show before becoming the just one who you've been the betrayers and murders of and received the disposition of the law from angels? How do you catch it? Every head bowed, every eye shut. <laughs> and they took old Stephen out there and they beat his brains out. He was a bloody corpse and he got through and he stepped up into heaven. The Lord said, well, welcome home, Stephen. He said, good to be home. Well, there's a mess down there. <laughs> And the Lord said, well, he said, uh, did you have a good ministry? He said, no, man. And the Lord said, well, uh, how many did you get saved in that last invitation? <laughs> and Stephen said, didn't have time to give an invitation. He said, man, they, they, they rocked me. They... <laughs> and they said, well, how many did you baptize? He said, I didn't baptize them. They baptized me with rocks. Man, I was immersed. <laughs> and the Lord said, well, there just must not have been any conviction by the Holy Spirit. And Stephen said, oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> And I know the Bible speaks about jesting, you know, and foolish talking, but I'm not talking foolish, and I ain't kidding. I mean, the Lord called him over and said, hey, you want to see something? Stephen said, yeah, what? The Lord said, I'll show you. Channel 7, <laughs> turn that thing on. He said, look. And old Stephen looked down there, and here's an old boy going down the room like this, just about like a page line going down there, king line going down there and saying, I said, he's a blasphemy. He should have died. He should have died. He should have died. He said, boy, that face. Face like an angel of God. But I must have been filled with a spirit. And I still say the devil angel, the devil's angel of life. He's a blasphemy to die, he'll die. Yeah, he should have taken it good. Pray and ask God to forgive him for his enemies. Why is And the Lord said, see that fellow? And Stephen said, yes. And the Lord said, see that bird right there? I'm going to put a pen in his hand and he's going to write 13 books. And when he gets through the 13 books he's going to write, old John R. Rice is going to have to use them. Old Lee Robertson going to have to use them. Old Dwight L. Moody going to have to use them. Old Billy Sunday going to have to use them. Old Hugh Powell going to have to use them. Old Bob Gray going to have to use them. Pretty good results for one meeting, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but you see, man, you see the great suggestion.